so tonight is bonfire night and I figured what better time to do an audio based piece of content than tonight. Arguably one of the longest ones I'm going to do as well, so let's go. So off the bat I know I'm inviting trouble by making a video like this, but these two they're just begging for a bit of a friendly contest. And both deserve a review for their latest efforts. They released their albums on the same day, both popular in very similar circles, and they've both been releasing some of their best material over the last few years in my opinion. And they're giving me something to digest while I've been waiting for my Beatles revolver box set to arrive. You've got two powerhouses in the Poptimist sphere. You've got the iconic Taylor Swift with a fairly low key but high class rollout for her latest album, Midnight's. I enjoy the Instagram stories of her reviewing the tracks and whatnot. It may be a surprise judging by some of the other content on my channel, but I quite enjoy some of her work. Taylor's version, fantastic reimagining of some of her prior work. You know, they've got a fresh look like, of modern paint over her very well known catalogue. And the message behind the entire project, I can fully get behind that too, an artist actually owning the work. Yeah, all for that, good stuff. And then you've got the last two efforts, Evermore and Folklore. They had some real gems on them. And Taylor was really heading in the direction that I could get behind. And even for that, you had a lover. Arguably my favourite Taylor album to date. I think the low-key moments on the album were fantastic. I think production value is incredible. Songs like Cruel Summer are just top tier. In general, it's a really warm, atmospheric pop album that I can get behind. I'd love to go back, give all her albums a review at some point, but for this I'm just bringing you up to speed on where I'm sort of standing with Taylor on the run up to Midnight's. And then you've got Carla, she has a far shorter catalogue, and the album rollout for the longest time was pretty extravagant really. You've got teaser singles, music videos and films, she's been on a tour during this time too. For me I enjoy Call Me Maybe, which was Carly's first real catapult to start. It was everywhere and I still think it holds up as a great pop song today really. You know, I look back very fondly at that song and the way it just captured that sort of moment in time of her coming up. It is a good sounding song. And then you got Emotion. I was completely blown away by that album. It was this really tasteful 80s synth pop inspired album and had track after track of just pure pop magic throughout it. Sentimental but playful. Prove Carly was around to stay, she wasn't just a one hit wonder, she was here. And with that album, she managed to carve out a real cult following. Then we got Dedicated, which I thought was solid. I guess my hot take on that album is I preferred Dedicated to IB. You know, again, she's another artist, I love to go more in depth on a full discography and another set of videos, but yeah, big fan, big fan of both. But for the purpose of this video, I'm just establishing, you know, where I stand on these two. On the run up to these two albums that came out on the same day, what a good day. So I'm going to start with Carly. Straight off the bat, you've got these strong striking synths that will lead you right into Surrender My Heart. It's an intimate sounding song with this anthemic chorus and this driving 80s inspired dance groove to it. Again, Carly, she's dipping right into the 80s with a modern like a paint over the top. On this, you've got Carly, she's singing about surrendering her inner heart and opening up to these vulnerabilities to a new partner. You've got these fun lines about introducing a partner to a not-so-perfect family. It's a fun, innocent number... That's just a beautiful, colourful flair, just starts the album off on just a good note, it's great. This is followed up by Joshua Tree, it's got this real crunchy bass line, real groove that digs into the song. It pushes it right along, it drives it along nicely. You know, Carly is striking while the iron is hot on this one. Proper upbeat disco number as she sings about California dreams and feeling dramatic, the moon and the magic. Almost feels frivolous lyrically in a way, but it just works when it's paired with this infectious groove. It's Good song, really solid song, Joshua Tree. And then, to round off this pretty stellar free track run, you've got Talking to Yourself. This is a summer vibe. Scully sings these lyrics about the impact she imagines she's had on her partners. She's completely rejecting the idea of stabbing herself with a broken relationship, and instead she's taking it. It's their loss, I'm moving on, that's her approach here. It's such an upbeat bop of a song, you can almost imagine Carly jiving behind the microphone as she sings the chorus on this one. It's an absolute monster of a pop song, and I'll admit, it's been stuck in my head for the past week or so. It's certainly up there when you think of highlights throughout Carly's discography. It's a real key moment and a real great track. And after that, near enough A tier run. You know, she steps things down a bit. You've got Far Away. It's a touch more reserved, and it's where the album sort of meanders almost. It feels a little more open. It's a nice song and it feels like something off dedicated side B. Good fun song about nurturing sort of romantic love with an earworm chorus. I've got to give it that much. Then you've got Sideways. Sideways is a good song but it doesn't strike any real punch. It's almost forgettable of a cut as far as this album goes. I guess you could say it's filler, I'm sorry to say. Then you've got one of the big singles off this album, Beach House. Works as a concept but, you know, it's a song about Carly. She's getting... She's not getting anywhere on this carousel of relationships. Every man in the song has a flaw. One's trying to harvest her organs. It's 
Kind of questionable. The needle drop described it as almost like an SNL type skit. And I think he's pretty spot on with that analysis. That's the sort of thing you're into in a song. It does nail it on, but I found it a bit cringy. It's fun, I guess, but just doesn't strike the right chord with me. And then this is followed up by Ben's. It's a touch more toned down a little key. Oh, we're going in a direction we don't really see from her too much these days. Vocal work always sounds tremendous on here. As it feels like she opens up on a level we rarely get to hear from her. Blue eyes, we are the sensitive ones. Where are you tonight? How can this be life? It's almost a palate cleanser of sorts from Beach House. It's a really strong, beautiful cut. I'm going to hand it to it. It's a gorgeous song. Really top tier. Really quite the highlight. And then you've got another one of the main singles, Western Wind. It's got these washed out, distant vocals of these timber drums. It's got an electronic percussion and these airy synths that linger under the track. Chilled out vibe. It's not the strongest cut on this album, but it's a song that has its place. It, it does work for what it is. I can see why it was probably a lead single. Might not have gone for it myself, but it is a good song. Good, chilled out summer vibes. And you've got Sir Nice. Doesn't do too much for me, but the chorus is pretty memorable. It's a good chorus, but it's followed by this. <laughs> throughout the entire song and Pearl's chorus. On the intro, it just doesn't work for me. Probably could have done without that on the track altogether. It'd probably be a good tune. If it weren't for that, that really knocks it down. Bad Thing Twice is another real bop on here. It's a slow burner of a track that initially I was pretty cold on, but has grown on me. It's a bouncy number. I particularly enjoyed this lyric. Instead of describing her relationship as a king and a queen, or a prince and a princess, Collie's a soldier. You were the king, and I was a soldier, babe. I fought for your attention, fought for your lonely eyes. Fresh feeling approach to me, I kind of liked it. It was good. Shooting star showcases a ball move with these Altered vocals from Carly, making it sound near enough inhuman during some passages. Doesn't quite work for me. I think under it, there's a decent song to be found. You've got these altered vocals that spoil the song somewhat, in my opinion. Go Find Yourself or whatever is a down-tempo song with a more so human-sounding Carly on display. With this lurky guitar strumming, with these choirs behind Carly, and this drum, it comes and picks up the pace somewhat. It feels like a real open wound moment. That seems to be about trying to move on from heartbreak. That we don't typically get from Carly as she sings lyrics like, I wake up hollow, you made me vulnerable. Like the sugar coating we typically find with Carly's music, but similar to Ben's, has a real heart to it. Those two tracks do really work. It's a nice stylistic song, it certainly pays off as far as risk goes. And then you've got the title track, Loneliest Time. This is a real nice closer. Featuring fellow Canadian Rufus Wainwright. The two nicely playing off each other. It's more so in character, playful song for Carla. She sings about bad dreams, longing and getting things right. It's a bit of a cheesy number, but it's the sort of cheese that you can forgive and just eat it up all day. It's a great tune. Overall, we get the most creatively diverse album in Carly's entire discography. The moments that really pay off on here, they're super strong. Talk to Yourself is a prime example of Carly capturing her already established sound and creating just an incredible pop song. Absolutely fantastic. And you've got a song like Ben's, which just pushes Carly in a more sort of vulnerable and sensitive direction, but it really pays off. There are a few cuts on here I'm pretty cold on, but overall I had a really good time with this album. I'm going to give it a 7. It's a good, fun pop album. You know, it's a real treat for a pop artist just to be this consistent in decent quality music coming out. Yeah, good vibes with this one. So then up next in this review, you've got Tale of Midnight's. So Lavender Haze kicks us off and nicely sets the tone for the majority of this album. It's smooth, sparse electronic production with Taylor almost opening up the dream world as she describes being consumed by Lavender Haze. I really like this introduction. I think it sets a nice tone and sets us up nice for this loose but fairly vivid concept Taylor's going for on here. Yeah, good introduction. And then up next you've got Maroon, one of my favourite tracks on here. Lyrically, she kind of plays on the colour. The maroon colour, maroon lipstick, maroon skies, the colour of a top when rosé spills on it. So Scarlet, it was maroon. And then it sort of turns into the feeling of being marooned. Taylor's then pushing these feelings of being emotionally striked through with the colour. Then she talks about losing sight of the relationship. You know, simply the idea of being alone. Yeah, she nicely portrays this feeling of abandonment and isolation. Feels like a modern twist on an older Taylor song. I really like this one. It's got a real heavy kick bass drum. That seems to just hold the entire track together. It just keeps going and going. It's great. Sparse, but it's tasteful. Really nicely executed. Almost reminds me of the track Lover, but it's got a darker slant on the musings Taylor's got on this relationship. It isn't as warm and cosy as Lover. 
Nova. It's a good song. And then you've got Antihero. I'll be honest, initially one of the weaker tracks on here. Near enough a skipper. It has soon grown to be one of my favourites on here. It's a real introspective song that feels like we get a real reflection on Taylor's insecurities. It's got this hazy feeling throughout the song as these neurotic thoughts race through Taylor's mind at what feels like the twilight hour of midnight. Midnights have become her afternoons. You've got this beautiful imagery of Taylor staring directly at the sun. I feel like this has shades of reputation within it, but it's more gentle and honest feeling as opposed to that bad girl imagery she was portraying on that album. It's a great song and feels like that dreamlike patchwork of your thoughts during the night just weaving together. It captures this idea pretty damn perfectly. I mean, it's a great song. I can forgive some of the questionable lyrics on this one because it is just... This, the song sounds like how it feels, and it feels a bit surreal, but honest. It, it is a mind race, and it is a good tune. Then up next, you've got Snow on the Beach. This feels like it was written with Honeymoon Period, Lana Del Rey in mind. And she is on this track, and she mainly contributes with the backing vocals. But it's a really solid song. It's this airy, wispy tune. We've got these breathy lyrics and bouncy strings. Again, these abstract, dreamlike lyrics. They're really strong lyrics about flying in a dream. The imagery of snow on a beach being weird, but fucking beautiful. They take you on this wonderland of love. Your eyes are like flying saucers from another planet. My favourite number on this album by far. Just a really beautiful sounding song and the two just play off each other great. I mean, when are we getting the collab album between these two? At least another song. Come on. It is brilliant. I mean, I mentioned Carly's three track run. I mean, Taylor's got a four track run here. It's seriously solid. Seriously impressed by this four track run. And then you've got You're On Your Own Kid, which isn't a bad song. It is a touch of a downgrade. The instrumentation just feels so bland and it leaves no real statement like the prior tracks. I actually think the string remix works better on the deluxe edition of this album. I mean, Taylor's still driving this patchwork instrumentation here while highlighting isolation, which does turn into a bit of a theme throughout the record. And then you've got Midnight Rain. It's got these altered vocals throughout it, perhaps an inner conscious revealing some sort of truth to her. There's things like chasing the fame, he stayed the same. Taylor's singing songs about how he was sunshine, I was midnight. I never think of him until midnight's like this. It's got these low-key drums and this gloomy mood to it, but again, it feels very one-dimensional and pretty one-note, which this album it does end up falling victim to that a bit. I mean, I understand cohesion, but after that initial first four tracks, we end up in this recycle like haze for a bulk of the album. It sort of gets lost and loses that initial run of like character just seeping through. Question, it's got these sims lurking under it and those sparse drums reoccurring again. Did you ever have someone kiss you in a crowded room? Every single one of your friends was making fun of you. And then 15 seconds later, they were clapping too. I mean, Taylor's like trying to create some sort of rom-com narrative throughout this track. We even get a crowd cheering on this one. I mean, it's kind of cringe. It's pretty lyrically off note for Taylor, who is typically really decent at writing lyrics. I mean, this just feels uninspired to me, to be quite honest. And again, the instrumentation is nothing much to really be desired. And then you've got vigilante shit. Taylor hopping back to something that feels like a B-side of reputation. Just toying with these themes of revenge. And got this bassy, punchy drum pattern behind her. It's a short number. It doesn't feel out of place or offensive, but you almost don't believe her. On reputation, Taylor, she had a bone to pick. This just feels like a song about revenge for the sake of a song about revenge. It just doesn't work for me, unfortunately. Then Taylor does pull it back, though. You've got Bejewel. It has shades of Out of the Woods from 1989. I'm sorry to be, like, reflecting back so much on a catalogue, but it's hard not to with tracks like this. And this one does stand out on the track listed on Midnight's. It's a bit more brighter and pretty sounding. Taylor's got a bit of swagger about her. She talks about, Best believe I'm still Bejewel when I walk in the room. I can make the whole place shimmer. It's a nice confident number. I really like this one. And you've got Labyrinth. That's an airy number about falling in love. But it's got this real hesitation looming underneath the theme here. As in being lost in a labyrinth, I suppose. It's ambient and Taylor sounds very different. I guess it works for what she's going for, but I don't know. It's another kind of bland tune, to be honest. Then you've got Karma. This catches my ears straight away. It pulls me back in. You've got like this radio that's being tuned up and it has these wavy synths that sound like the straight out of Vaporwave record. It's unreal, this instrumentation. I love it. It's so dreamlike again. You know, capturing these themes and feelings that she seems to be really good at throughout this album. It's one of the stronger cuts on the latter half of this record and it's got this real funky vibe to it. It's Taylor toys with all the things Karma could be. It feels like it permeates through our eye. How she's captured it and nurtured it and it always seems to work in her favour. I mean, perhaps Taylor's reflecting how she had a stumble as far as drama goes with the whole Kimye situation. It appears that like Pigier may be getting a taste of karma. Taylor's kind of enjoying that. I don't want to read into it too much, but it's a good number. 
and you've got sweet nothing this feels like a low buy as you've got this keyboard pattern throughout it it's a real light number the lyrics again they don't feel all too inspired but it, this one works more so for what it is it's not an offensive cut it doesn't feel like a real waste of space or anything like that and then to wrap this thing up you've got mastermind this is lyrically more on point for taylor and instrumentally it feels like one of the stronger moments you've got this sparse electronic theme throughout it as several distinct passages and it switches into from the verse to the chorus it's a nice way to round out this album. It feels like a, it makes a real statement of sorts, which quite a few of the lower ranking tracks in here, they fail to do that job in my book, but this one rounds us out very nicely. Overall, Midnight's feels like a more appropriately dreamy sounding album. At times, it shimmers so bright with these fascinating lyrics and very carefully selected instrumentation. You know, there's a real diversity within this album too. It packs a real punch while capturing a array of emotions. Over time, it falls victim to the complete opposite. Some of the tracks feel lyrically bland and almost meaningless with meandering, repetitive instrumentation. Other times, it almost feels like a satire on Taylor's work. It's, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag to be honest with you but you know when this album does work it does pack a good punch like lavender haze it's got them sparse drums that we capture throughout the entire album this one it clearly serves a purpose but some of those songs that are a bit more sparse and lurky you know midnight rain vigilante shit whatever they almost feel mundane was kind of boring they're just such a clear step down from the highs that this album has to offer up and there are highs real good strong highs i mean i can see myself returning to plenty of the tracks i guess what i'm trying to say in my book we could have had a killer seven track ep instead we got a pretty decent album so i'm probably gonna give this one a six overall i think if we're comparing to midnight's is a dark moody album it's a wintry album and what carly does she sort of takes us to a world of sonic sunshine where we're drinking juice made out of the fruit on the album cover but here both artists appear to have removed a layer of film from their music that touches on a slightly more i'm not going to say personal level but because both artists have released what i feel is very personal music especially taylor but it feels like it's from a more so introspective place. I mean, overall, we can say October the 21st, 2022. Good day for pop. Very good day for pop music. Two absolute icons in the pop sphere releasing two really pretty solid albums, really. I mean, I didn't walk away disliking any of these albums. Yeah, pretty good stuff, man. I'd love to hear any thoughts that you guys had on these albums. If I'm missing anything, if you loved it, if you hear what I'm saying, yeah, just let me know. I'm interested. Always up for a bit of dialogue. Love to hear other people's thoughts. And nice job making it through this. So, yeah, have a good one.